Yes, welcome. My name is Peter Nell and I'm the Chief Business Officer and Head of Therapeutics at Mammoth Biosciences, which is a company that is working on the next generation of CRISPR-Cas platform. And I would like to introduce you to the company and what we're doing during the next few slides. Um, I think it's very important to mention the mission because that's what excites the employees of Mammoth Biosciences. It's improving lives by reading and writing the code of life. And I will show you what we mean by reading and writing. The leadership team is a very distinguished uh, team coming from the co-founder perspective uh, out of UC Berkeley and Stanford. And you see here on the right side, Jennifer Doudner, who is very well known for her uh, work and inventions in the CRISPR-Cas9 field, but also Janice Chen, Lucas Harrington, who have been graduate students in her lab and have been involved in many of the discoveries around CRISPR-Cas. And complemented is this by Ted Tisch, who's our chief operating officer uh, coming in from Syntego, Biorat before, and myself. I have a background also in small companies like Casibia, which was a company that is also involved in CRISPR-Cas technology, and then a big pharma company, Bayer. We are supported by investors, as you can see here on the lower button of the slide by very well-known investors and also some selected individuals. The company is well-funded. And when we look at the CRISPR-Cas technology, if you go back to the initial discovery by Jennifer Doudna and others, uh, you see that initially it was used as a system to really edit DNA. So there was a double strand break that was initiated and then repair mechanisms kick in and you get an outcome. When we look at the system, we see it more nowadays as a reading system, as a search engine. It's really coming back to this metaphor of using Google to search something, and then you can do various things. And you can, for example, read, write, knock out, modulate on the right. And we're working actually in many of these fields, and um, that's where the company was built on. But for many of these, you also need specialized CRISPR-Cas systems. So Cas9 is not the only one, and it might not work for all of these specific cases. So we have a discovery group that is working on identifying novel CRISPR-Cas systems. And 12, 13, 14 Cas fee are mentioned here. I will go into a little bit more detail later. And then we build upon this discovery group and move into applications. One of the applications where some of the co-founders and Jennifer Dowder's lab have been spearheading the use of CRISPR technology is for diagnostic uses. But we're also working on building a therapeutics pipeline and on using the systems for editing, specifically for newer applications and those spaces where CRISPR-Cas9 or closely related compounds might not be the best suited for. Building the discovery arm, as I mentioned, is a proprietary system, a process that has been brought into the company. It's building on an extremely large, what we believe is the largest database of metagenomic data in the world. We're using that to extract from these systems that might be of interest. And you see here on the left, the funnel, how we look through these data in silico identification, high throughput screening methods, and so on. And finally, what we try to achieve is here using the diversity of nature by filling in and constantly are adding the metagenomic data, trying to identify systems where nature has potentially already solved issues. And we don't start initially with protein engineering like some other companies do, but we do first the natural selection and then we potentially add the protein engineering on top of this to make these even better. But in many cases, this might not even be needed. I'll give you one example for the diagnostics application. Um, and um, I think it's a very motivating example because it's such a current situation with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus being around. Um, it, back in January, the, the company had a collaboration ongoing with UCSF and quickly pivoted when the first samples of patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 came in to try to use the technology for detection of this specific virus. And we had been working already on what we call the detector technology, where you try to use the CRISPR system to read RNA or DNA. 
and then to this connected the cutting that you usually do on the dna of for example a disease gene you are cutting a single stranded dna of a probe and by that cutting you exhibit a signal and that can be read out and so we are able to quickly actually within 20 to 30 minutes to go from the sample to the readout and show if a patient has been infected actively with SARS-CoV-2. And this has resulted in one white paper that is published in Nature Biotechnology. We also received the EUA for the clinical validation of reagent set at CLA high complexity labs. Um, so it can be used at UCSF right now. And we are continuing, and you see this on this slide, to move this further next to the other diseases that we're already looking at and have been looking before COVID came up. Um, so we're looking into creating a decentralized use of this technology. Could you imagine, for example, if you would be able to test at home with a device like exemplified here in this drawing on the left, um, a single use disposable. And that's what we're doing in collaboration with GSK Consumer Care. On the other hand, there's also need, as you know, for high throughput testing for COVID-19. And so we're also working, and that's funded by NIH, on laboratory-based automation. So really a simple workflow with extremely high throughput in the thousands up to millions of daily tests that the US, for example, has to do. We're working on that and trying to distribute this into various labs that then can then do this testing at high throughput. And that's continued. Now moving to the genome editing, specifically for therapeutics. As you know, Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 is an excellent system. It's now in the clinic, has been tested. Both ex vivo first patients have been treated. Also in vivo testing is ongoing um, in the eye and potentially and hopefully soon for other diseases systemically. However, if we look at it and look at all the indications that might require programs here to find cures, there are some shortcomings of CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, for example, it's a very large protein, so it's very difficult to deliver uh, to specific target organs if you want to apply it systemically. Multiplexing is still a challenge, so where you do multiple edits at the same time. Uh, Off-target effects, that's for sure always a challenge that we try to minimize. And then also the targeting range uh, is potentially a challenge because what you need is the so-called PEM sequence. And this needs to be very close to the site where you want to cut the DNA or manipulate the DNA. And if you have a higher diversity in this PEM sequence, that's definitely helpful to achieve these in more and different targets. And then immunogenicity has also been discussed as a risk because the CRISPR-Cas9 system originates from bacteria. And so there might be actually patients that have already been uh, introduced to Cas9 or Cas9 has been introduced to them by infection through these bacteria. And so the, the treatments might not be working in these patients. And so different systems might be needed here as well. And then finally, for sure, you all know about the challenge or the open questions on the IP situation of CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, so if there would be approaches that have cleaner situations here that would also be appreciated. Oops. So if we look at what we are working on at MAMIS right now, we are, I would like to introduce you to two of the most advanced examples. And one is the family of CRISPR-Cas14 systems that had been discovered in Jennifer Doudna's lab and Lucas Harrington, one of our co-founders, he was instrumental to this discovery. And this is a new class which originates from uncultivated archaea. So not from bacteria, as mentioned previously, Cas9, um, but from uncultivated archaea. And the very interesting part here is that these are extremely compact systems. So if you look here on the right side, SP-Cas9, which was one of the most commonly used CRISPR-Cas9 systems, you see 1,380 amino acids in length. That's quite a large protein. But if you look at Cas14, that's one example here, 529 amino acids. That's less than half the size of these Cas9 systems. And also Cas12 systems, Cas12a, if you look at that, which is 
um, a sub-member known as CPF1 as well. You see that these are way more bigger than CAS14, which might enable actually the in vivo disk delivery that we mentioned earlier. Um, if you think about packaging restrictions for adenine-associated viruses like AV, um, you see that this might be a huge advantage here. And more recently, we also got access to a new system out of Jennifer Doudner and Jill Banfield's lab at UC Berkeley, which is called CASFI. The fee gift or the name is given because of the origin of these of phages. Um, they were found in huge phages. A recent science publication gives some details here. Um, they are also an extremely interesting uh, class of CRISPR-Cas system. And again, you see here on the lower right side, the size is extremely interesting. It's smaller systems than Cas9, not as small as Cas14, but they are in the 700 to 800 amino acids. So it most likely will have a huge impact on everything that you want to work around delivery with these CRISPR-Cas system. But also they have some other attributes. For example, they do not require trace RNA. They process their own CRISPR RNA. And we have exclusive licenses to these. Uh, so we can use these for therapeutics and some other applications as well, including agricultural use and so on, and the diagnostic use for sure as well. I will give you some overview here. This is from the publication in Science that came out recently. And you see the data here for an experiment in hex cells, GFP readout. Um, these are numbers that are comparable to the early days of Cas9. And it is too early to show you here um, data because this is a non-confidential presentation. But the MAMAS team has been working internally for some time now, and we have already identified more advanced systems. Coming back to the diversity of the, the system and the discovery engine combined, the team was able to really identify some extremely interesting family members of CASFI that show higher editing. And we also have started, for sure, to characterize these in additional systems uh, moving into primary cells and so on. Another very interesting aspect of these two novel systems, CAS14, cas and you'll see here also on this slide CAS12M, which is another mammoth internal system that we haven't fully disclosed yet. They show this higher flexible PAM sequence. And on the right side, you see here in analysis that shows you that with this flexibility in the PAM sequence, you might reach further targets. So the targetable sites are listed here in the human genome. And then the so-called PEM sequences on the bottom of this slide, the x-axis. And you see, for example, TTTC, which would only address a few targets. But then if you go to the right ones, which reflects the ones that Mammoth has access to, like TR, TB, you see many more targets, uh, magnitude of 10 times more that you would be able to address uh, with these novel CRISPR systems. So that might open up um, novel diseases or other diseases to be targeted, but also potentially um, helping for multiplexing, as you might imagine. So summarizing uh, these two systems here, we believe really the IP situation is much more favorable uh, in this situation. Uh, we have exclusively licensed the IP from UC Berkeley, the patent landscape based on our analysis, but also an external analysis um, that we asked for um, shows that this might be the case. We believe that the small size of these novel systems will enable much better delivery. And this is not only true for the conventional sense where you use it as a cut and paste system or cut and repair system, but also if you think about additional technologies, new modalities like base editing and so on, where you even fuse additional proteins to the CRISPR-Cas system, if you have a very small starting point, that will be very beneficial uh, most likely for this. And if you do the math, for example, it should be possible uh, to have a Cas14 base, base editor to fit in one AV while the traditional um, approaches right now based on CAS9 or CPF1, they don't fit in one AV and have to be split. We also believe the targeting scope will be improved using these novel systems. 
And then I mentioned the potential risk of immunogenicity response and both Cas14 and Cas1, one from uncultivated archaea, the other one from phages, might not have this challenge. So there might be another advantage here for in vivo applications. So currently we are working on discovery of these systems. We are adding new systems. We are exploring new modalities, actually. What can we use these for, the applications? but also the in vivo delivery to really show this as a proof of concept. At the same time, we are building our internal therapeutics pipeline. And today it's too early to talk about this, but hopefully in the future, we can disclose more here what our ideas are and where we see a real fit of these novel CRISPR systems. And we're also currently talking to potential partners, um, trying to make use of these systems in areas of high medical unmet need. And this moves over to the, the final slide here, the partnering slide, really. What I've shown you already in the diagnostics part, we are partnering, for example, with GlaxoSmithKline. We receive NIH funding. This is one for the at-home device, one for the high throughput. We also have an ongoing collaboration with Horizon Discovery on the editing and discovery of novel CRISPR systems out of this toolbox. Um, that can be used for CHO cell line editing that is then used for biomanufacturing. But as mentioned, we are also very much interested, and that's why we are presenting here at this conference, very much interested in discussions, additional discussions in partnering and making use of these very exciting systems for us. And really on the final slide here, I would like to thank you for your attention. And this is our contact information, but I'm also attending these conference and the system. You can schedule meetings with me. Thank you very much.